Wow, here we are, folks. This is Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Wow, and this study right here, it's just unreal. We are going to have to go from in the beginning. The first word, <clears throat> in the beginning was God, and God was God, and he was the light of the world, and he was the spokesman of the world, and he was the one that spoke it into existence. And we see the very first verse in Genesis is this, uh, God revealed. Now we want to look. Let's look at the last verse in Revelation. Revelation 22 <clears throat> and verse 20 and 21. Look. He which testifieth these things proclaim that the fact of the office of the Messiah is Savior. Repeated again and again throughout the prophecy, he is the Lamb of God who was slain and his blood washed the sin and alone makes fit for entrance into eternal life. Now listen, this was done for the Jews. Now remember that the Gentile was grafted in because of the rejection of the Jewish nation. Uh, we are to thank our Jewish brothers for our salvation because we have it because of them. In spite of the fact it was done with a uh, nonsensical act that they did there. Let's say, saying, he says, surely I come quickly. Now, God came quickly when he spoke the earth into existence. And he quickly spoke the earth into existence. Now, here is the last of him saying, I leave the promise to come as the last message from the Lord. Uh, so Jesus is to be the believing heart and to the sweet note of the prophecy ends. He said, listen to this, Amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus. This proclaims the answer of the true church. The true church are those who believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and as the Savior, Jew and Gentile, either one. The promise of Christ regarding the second coming. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says in verse 21. And, and what he's saying here, John using the very words of Paul in his closing benediction, that Christ is the source, but the cross is the means. Christ himself, the human body, was the source of, and the cross was the means by which was being used to transfer him from the living body that he was to the living body reincarnated by God the Father and came back on the third day and walked on this earth, showing us we are going to do the same thing. We're not going to come back and walk on the earth the next day, but we are going to come back and walk on this a, a, a earth from heaven one day we are going to. So it's very important that we see that. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. The last words. Listen to the <clears throat> proclamation of the facts. That's the same message for all. All races, all peoples, and all. And it is available to all. <clears throat> the word amen closes out the book of Revelation. And, uh, the, in fact, the entire canon of the scriptures, the whole canon of scriptures that we have before us is closed out in this. It took roughly about 1,600 years uh, to bring uh, in its entirety. And it gives a claim to the finished work. Notice this, the finished work of Christ who was God in the flesh and came in the flesh. It is done. And thereby all of heaven, along with all the redeemed, must say, Amen. I am one of the redeemed, and I am a Gentile. If you are a Jewish person, listen to this. If you are a descendant of the Hebrews somewhere down the line, you are a chosen vessel also. 
and you were chosen before the Gentiles were. And so you must act upon that if you want to go to heaven. Uh, he said he sent his angel. Look, I, Jesus, this sort of phrase is found only here in the scripture. It emphasizes what Jesus himself is saying. It is an importance that Christ is closing out the book of Revelation. And, and Christ is closing out this book, and he wants us to know that if we don't act upon it, and most of all, he is testifying to the truth of what he has given, which was his self. He had given his self to all, whosoever loved him. And, and he sent his angel to the church. He said, I am the root and the offspring of David. Well, David was uh, in the line of Jesus Christ and came down through and brought the morning star. And the morning star speaks of the new beginning that any person can have irrespective or it doesn't make any difference, no respect to their nationality. None. No irrespective. No respect to their nationality. And no respect of this situation. They can be in prison and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. And he will. They can be on death row and the guy's fixing to push the button. And just before he pushes the button, the man says, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. And that man pushes that button and that soul goes to heaven and not hell. If you are in prison, if you are living in a place, where you're near death row all the time, you need to say that prayer. And you need to uh, ask God to deliver you. Uh, he can deliver you through death. If you ask him just before death, he can deliver you through death. Now, if you're going to purposely wait until then, you may not have that chance. See, I'm the root and offspring of David. This projects the incarnation of Christ. And this projects the fact he was the bright and morning star. I don't care what your present situation is, Gentile or Jew, either one, or anybody else. You could be a Muslim. You could be uh, a Mohammed follower. You could be a Buddhist following Buddha. Uh, you could be following any one of any religion and say out of that religion, I am going to switch to Jesus Christ and I'm going to follow what he did and what he says and therefore you will go to heaven. Now if you follow Buddha, you go with whatever Buddha has. If you follow Confucius, you go to into total confusion when you die. And if you follow uh, any other religion, you go where that religion is. And that many, many, many of those religions already have their uh, uh, reservations in hell. Their reservations are in hell. And, and those who totally reject Jesus Christ and curse him, as from what he says, they will be in the hottest part of hell. They're going to be in the hottest part of hell. And hell is fire, but it's hotter and cooler spots, even though it is all hell. Let's go back all the way to the book of Ezekiel. Number one that I did yesterday, 41 minutes of talking on uh, the fact about the same subject, that the children of Israel are the chosen people of God. Now, let's look at the signs of the two sticks in Israel and Judah rejoined. In Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 15, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, now this is the second time he's come to him, and this is the second prediction of unity of nations. And, and the happy settlement under the government of the Messiah. Now, all nations, Gentile and Jew, can go through the same thing in this day and age. Just exactly 
like the, the tribes did back in that day and age when they they got together. God gave them the land. You remember he divided it into 12, 13 sections and he gave them the 13 sections, 12 uh, to the tribes and one to the children of the uh, tabernacle, to the priest. Uh, moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it. But Judah and for the children of Israel and his companions, they took another stick and write upon it Joseph and the stick of Ephraim. And for all the house of Israel is companion and his companions. Now, we are companions. I am a Gentile. I am a companion of the Jews. And, and if I'm companion of the Jewish Bible, this Bible was written for the Jews, but here, here the companion of the Jews, myself as a Gentile, I am grafted in. And so this book is for me, just like it's for the Jewish people. And when I read it, it comes to my heart, in my heart, just like it comes in their heart, if they don't reject it. And then look at verse 17. He said, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. And he joined those sticks together, and they became one stick in his hand. Wow, that's saying that God has accepted us Gentiles just exactly like he accepted those Jews, those Jewish people, the first Hebrew people. And he joined them together. Wow, in the kingdom, signifying one people. And this is the same thing we see now over in Revelation. We went all the way to Revelation. We saw that. We're going to stop in Colossians. We're going to stop by Thessalonians. We're going to visit Revelations. And, and when the children of your people shall speak unto you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by this? Wow, that's the prophecy that incorporates a balance. A balance. What is a balance? That's the center line of something that's half over here and half over here. There's a center line. And if you put it on a balance, the Bible is the balance. The Bible is the balance. And God is the stayer. He's staying the balance. And the balance is either side is equal, and the balance is going to come up properly at the end, which incorporates the balance of the the chapter products of the future. The, the, the products of these chapters, all these chapters in this Bible, in this book, all these chapters in this book are uh, uh, balanced evenly from the Old Testament to the New Testament. By the way, this is a whole Bible. This is a nice whole Bible. You need to get some like this to carry in your back pocket if you are a studier of the Word. And you can take it out and study it any time you want to. I do many things. I traveled today a pretty good distance to see a, a person in the Lord and hunt for them, down, hunt them down, and talk to them in the Lord. And while I'm doing that, I had the Book of Romans on in my tape player, in my truck, my car, and I listened to the book of Romans, the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And then on the way home, I listened to them again. So I've listened to the book, whole book of Romans today twice, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians twice. And now here I am, back in the Old Testament. But you know what I find out? That if you study the Old Testament enough, when you get in the New Testament, it is a revision of the Old Testament. Whatever is said in the New Testament, just about, nearly verbatim, every verse can be found in the Old Testament. It's kind of like a copy with a different... If you were translating the same words from one language to another, they say the same thing in the other language. Well, you're translating what the Old Testament said into the New Testament, and it's saying the same thing on... This is a same-day book. This is a same-day book. This book is for 
then, for in between then and now, and it's for this day, and it's for the day to come. It's a past, present, and future book. Three in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. All three are one. Just like I am a body, I am a soul, and I am a spirit. Now, this body is going to go to a grave on this earth one day. And this soul and this spirit is going to go to heaven to receive a new body. A heavenly body. Why can't I go to heaven in this body? Because this body was sown in sin. And there will be no sin in heaven. None. Nada. No sin in heaven. That's the end of it. There, uh, nothing sinful can go into heaven. That's why I am so diabolically against tattoos. They are an earthly thing. I read the scripture and I see that God said that his eyes are like a flaming fire. I, the only picture I could see, why would his eyes be like a flaming fire? Well, the Bible tells us to burn the dross off. What is the dross? The dross of a body would be those tattoos. If God had to burn the dross off those tattoos, off on the body, if that body, when that body is resurrected and judged and and then sent to where it's going. And so uh, there are some things that are really difficult to answer. There is an answer. The answer may be, wait, and I'll reveal it to you when you get to heaven. How about that? We don't particularly like that answer, but that's the answer we get sometimes for some things. So we see that we will join. And when the children of your people shall speak unto you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? And that, what, what mean by what? What are these? What do you mean these? That's the prophecy. And again, we come up against that balance. And, and he's going to show them what he means by what he's saying for the land of Israel and for the settlement under one shepherd, God the Father, who is three in one, God the shepherd. He is that one that's going to settle the whole matter at the end, and he settled the matter during they were uh, their divinely trip in the desert. You, you don't think that was a divine trip? Why were they in the desert? Were they in the desert because God put them there intentionally? No. God took them out across that sea to walk them, march them into the Holy Land, into that land of milk and honey. But they refused with doubt. Doubt refused what they were supposed to have. If they hadn't have doubted, they would have walked into the Holy Land. God probably would have drove them folks out of there with bees or something and fleas or something. He'd have drove them out of there and then down away with the fleas or the bees and those children of Israel would have walked in. No battle. God said, I'm the one who will do the battle. He was going to do the battle. He didn't have to send any soldiers in. He didn't have to do anything. He just said, you follow me. But they quit. They got up to the gate, and they would not open the gate. And the gate was unlocked. God unlocked the gate. He said, just open it up and walk in. But they would not do it. They refused by doubt. And therefore, they wandered in the wilderness, and all but the few that went into the promised land died. All but a few. Do you know they had to have, I forgot what the number is now, but hundreds of burials every single, for 40 years, for three and a half million people to die. You had to have so many hundred a day die. Their life was consumed with burying bodies and Moving, burying bodies and moving, burying bodies and moving, burying bodies and moving. Their life was consumed with that. Maybe so, every couple, three months they had to move. Can you imagine three and a half million people in one spot for several weeks? 
how what degrative it would become with human waste and human uh, uh, disposal of everything, all kinds of things other than just human defecation, all kinds of other things that cause uh, disease and everything else. And then they had to cleanse themselves and move the tabernacle. That was a big job. But you've got to remember one thing, too. These were working people. These were people that were slaves in Egypt. They knew how to work. And God made sure that he kept them busy. When he, when he told them about the boards and the staves and the uh, lead laven and the water and everything, when he told them everything that was beaten, by the way, Jesus Christ himself was the rock that followed them in the desert, that poured the water out, that made the stream of water, that they could wash their clothes, that they could fill the laven. The laven that was in the tabernacle was for God, and God provided it with himself through his son, Jesus Christ, provided that water that was in that laven that they used to wash their hands with, that they used to drink, that they used to sacrifice with. Jesus provided it all. He divided, he paid. He, he's the one that paid the price before you saw him pay the price. He had to travel with this disobedient and grumbling group. And he's furnishing them the water, never cutting it off, and furnishing them the water. You remember when he told Moses to strike the rock the first time and the water came out? That was showing the picture of Jesus going to the cross. And then the next time God said to Moses, Moses, speak to the rock. Now, Jesus was aware. He was listening. And Moses was to speak to him. Instead, he smote him. And God said, because of that, you're going to have a curse on you. Oh, the water came, but a curse came with it. And so, let's get back in the book. All right. Let's look at these sticks. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph. How about that? Now, Joseph has become a stick, which is the head of Ephraim. Okay, and that's that tribe, the tribes of Ephraim. And the tribe of Israel, his follow and his fellows. And will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah. Now, remember, he separated these 12 tribes into 12, 12 different locations in the land of Israel. Israel. And I will make them one stick and they shall be one in my hand. Wow. He's saying that I'm going to take all divisions of all the peoples, the Jewish peoples, and I'm going to make them all as one stick. And they're all going to agree. You see, when God takes a group of his servants, he unites them. If he takes a group of servants, he unites. I, I today I had beautiful time, beautiful time today. I out hunting a friend. I couldn't find him to save my life, and I got to witness and talk to this one and that one and old ones and young ones and preachers and Christian people, non-Christian people, and uh, I passed tracks out, and I just had the best time. Didn't find my friend. Ended up having to drive. Uh, right at probably 50-something uh, miles back home after driving 60-something miles looking. and But I had one of the best times I ever had in my life out there witnessing, talking to people, meeting people in a different state. I live in Georgia. Those people in Alabama, they're nice folks. I don't care where you meet them. You can drive up in the yard and meet them. They're nice folks. They speak Alabamian. I can't speak that way. I can't speak Texan either. So, but, but anyway, they're like one stick. Those that I met, they were already saved. And my last, one of my last conversations was with a Methodist preacher who has two churches. He does one church at 9 in the morning and then runs over to another church and does it at 10. And, uh, and he does two churches. Real nice guy. Real nice guy. Methodist preacher on his way to heaven. You say, you're not a Methodist. No, I'm not a Methodist, 
But God took the Methodists and the Baptists and he wrapped them together and he made them one. And the Church of God and the Church of Christ and all the other little churches out here. If they believe that Jesus Christ came and gave his blood on the cross to save their soul, we are all one, even though we have a different name over the top of our door. If we believe properly, Jesus is going to enter every one of those churches. Just exactly, look at the picture. Look at the picture of the uh, Passover lamb. Jesus said, uh, God said, I'm going to send the death angel in there. And everybody, no matter who you are, if you're in this village, and you put blood over your doorpost and on the lentils, I'm going to pass by your house and the death angel won't touch you. Now, they may not have all been the children of Israel. And they may have been. The sign was the blood on the top of that doorpost and on the side. You say if there was an Egyptian in that house and he was the oldest child of somebody else, he didn't die. I'm saying he was protected by that blood if he was in that house. And God knew every person. He also knew this. He told them to take a very a lamb per family the size of the family. That there would be none left for in the morning. And consume that lamb. What was God doing? He was occupying the mind of a human being. He was occupying the hands of a human being. By taking the lamb and preparing it. You had to kill it and then you had to skin it. You had to pull the skin off. You had to dress it. You had to wash it. You had to clean it. You had to put it on the stove and, and, and cook it. And you had to cut it up and you had to eat it. What was God doing there? He was occupying those people. So they wouldn't be wringing their hands when that death angel comes by. Are we going to get killed or this or that? No, he had within their hands and in their eyes and in their vision, because they're human beings and they're weak, he said, I'm going to give them something to do. And so he gave them something to do. And they had something to do. And, and while they're doing that, they're not thinking about the death angel coming. They're not worrying about that. They're worrying about doing what God said to do. And that's what they were doing, what God said to do. He said, David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now, David was ever looked at as the example of the king of Israel. And David is going to, Jesus Christ is going to rule from the throne of David again one day. And that consequently will serve in this capacity under Christ forever. This throne that was set up was set up forever. And it's going to be used in heaven. And they shall dwell in the land that I give them, Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their uh, prince forever. What is he saying? He's saying he's going to put David back on the throne. He's going to give these children of Israel a place in, in the new kingdom. And they're going to have this place. And they're going to be ruled by this king. And I believe this is the talking about the thousand year reign. Because the 144,000 Jewish people that are going to come in, in that reign, and they're going to be there. And the Spirit used the phrase here, my servant David. The Spirit of God, writing this book, used the phrase, my servant David. Never once is Christ called my servant David. So it's obvious that the King David is the one predicted here to be their prince forever. You say, but David died thousands of years ago. Now, David was translated thousands of years ago to heaven, to be with God. And he is going to be, he's still alive, and he's going to be used again during this period of time. God is going to give him a body back, and he's going to set him on a throne, and he's going to be ahead of those Israelite children during that thousand year reign. You say, you really believe that, Brother Peter? Can you prove that to me? I can tell you this. 
If you've done as much study on this subject as I have, you'll come to the same conclusion. <laughs> uh, not that I'm a, I'm not a wise person. I'm kind of, in a sense, an illiterate person in a way. Yet, if you stay in the Bible, God will reveal you what the Bible says. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It, listen, verse 26. This is the new everlasting covenant. And in, in, uh, uh, verse 26 of uh, uh, chapter 37 in Ezekiel. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. What does that mean, Brother Peter? Does that mean there's going to be another temple built? As David's going to rule as a as the human being that he was? And are they, they're going to worship again, but they'll worship properly this time during the thousand-year reign. This, this divine sanctuary in Jerusalem will cause the heathen to know that God has especially chosen Israel. There are many, many heathens who hate Jewish people or Israelites. There are many... Uh, over there in Arabia, in those countries over there, that hate the Jewish people. They hate Israelites. Some of those people are going to be in the thousand-year reign. And they're going to have to be won over by those Israelites. They're going to have to be won over by King David. They're going to have to be won over. That's one of God's thousand-year reigns he's going to have. We don't know how many of those... Uh, that he plans on having ahead, and but we do know after that thousand years, things are going to change. Uh, the sanctuary that's described in chapter 40 through 48, my tabernacle, God's tabernacle, also shall be with them. That's Jesus Christ. I will be their God, and they will be my people, and I will tabernacle with them. Jesus Christ is going to tabernacle with with those people. He's going to be their tabernacle during that period of time. Wow. Uh, let's look at Isaiah uh, 4 and 5. And in Isaiah 4 and 5, Isaiah Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah 51. Let's go all the way back to verse 45. Let's go back to 4. Isaiah 4. Isaiah 8. All right, four and one. There's one. Let's find four. Two. Chapter four and one. And in that day, ooh, I did a study just a bit ago. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us call your name to take away our reproach. Verses 1 and 2 refer to the great tribulation. This is going to be in the great tribulation. As soon as it come upon the earth. Matthew 24, 21. We'll go over there in a minute. And see, as well as the coming glorious millennium, as Isaiah prophesied, continuing the Holy Spirit, after giving the horrors of yet to come, great tribulation now continues with the glorious word of mercy. And we're going to go over now to Matthew 24, 21. Let's take this Bible and go to Matthew 24, 21. Matthew 24, 21. All right. Isn't that funny? I always get that last page stuck. And he said in 21 here, I can stop there, I guess. I, I like to go on, but I'll stop there. And 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor even shall be. And unless those days be shortened, no flesh will be saved 
but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Do you know there was a day in the Bible, back in the Old Testament, when they actually cooked and ate their babies? In King Solomon's day, there was a place where there was a great famine. And his King Solomon is in his place with plenty. But has this group, these two ladies come to him and said, yesterday we cooked my baby, and today she doesn't want to cook this baby. So he said, well, we'll figure out which one's which. He said, get me a sword, and we're going to cut the baby in half. And the woman that owned the baby said, no, no, don't cut it in half, give it to her. And so she was, ended up with her own baby. But there were some times in the Old Testament when we see, just like these women taking this man and dividing him up and eating him, that it can happen. When hunger, true hunger, hits the world, it's chaos. People will eat people again. When the cows is gone, the horses are gone, the cats are gone, the dogs are gone, the rats are gone, and there's no flesh to be found, Katie bar the door because it's coming on. So, I don't know where I am time-wise. I'm going to have to figure out and get myself a timeline and put it out here. But I'm going to I'm going to wind up here in a minute. Now, we are looking at the new and everlasting covenant in Ezekiel chapter 37. And in chapter 38, the prophecy again against the Gentile powers of Armageddon, God to be uh, put back in the place. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog and the chief princes of Meshach and Tubal and prophesied against him. Now, what he's saying is that Gog and Magog and all those others, they are Antichrist. And you're going to prophesy against them. Verse 3, And son, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief and the prince of Meshach and Tobal, and I will turn you your back and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you forth and all your armies, horses, horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. This prophecy refers to the battle of Armageddon. You remember that the blood is going to flow to the horse's bridle 200 miles. What kind of a, a battle could, could we see? Where would the people come from to do that? Well, at this time, the Euphrates has been dried up. And China could be this group of people. They have millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people over there. Could fill this description. The first envision will take place in the midst of the Great Tribulation when the Antichrist will show uh, his true color. You see, when he comes, he comes as an angel of light. And in the mid-tribulation, he shows himself. Uh, Persia and Ethiopia and Libya and all them that shield and helmet, Goma and all his bands and the house of uh, Togomai and the north quarters and all his bands and many people with them. Uh, I think this passage merely refers to the statement that was previously made that the armies of the Antichrist have come against God. He said, Be thou prepared, verse 7, prepare for yourself and all your company that are assembled unto you, and be thou a guard unto them. When he's saying be prepared, the only thing you and I can do to be prepared for anything is get in this book and follow this book and get close to God, and we can be prepared for whatever it is. Uh, we have been given the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the, and the Word of God is the only thing that will defend against the Antichrist. So if we're going to prepare ourselves, the very best we can do in ability is avail ourselves 
with the words of God. You say, where are we going to be? Well, if I'm already saved and everything, I'm going to heaven. I'll already be in heaven. I will already have been caught up in the twinkling of an eye. And if you're saved, you will have been caught up in the twinkling of an eye. And if you're a Jewish person and you now say, I believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he did come from the Father God, and he was the third part of the Godhead, and he died for me even though it was my ancestors that put him on the cross. He still died for me. And if you believe that, you will be caught up in the twinkling of an eye too, and you will be not, not be left in this battle. And when I first started this study, and the study's too long to put in a few hours of speaking, this would take weeks to put it all down, the way it falls out. It would take weeks to put it down. And, and just maybe we could study for a whole year and speak on it a whole year. I study behind several, several men. I study behind our radio preacher that has his daily program. I have his five-year walk through the bus, the Bible bus. I have his five years all in one, or not in one. I have it in three folders, his five-year walking through the Bible on the Bible bus, J. Vernon McGee. I have lots of peoples. I have probably a thousand or two tapes. I probably have two or three thousand sermons and uh, that I listen to uh, ardently, often, day every day. I, I, there's not a day passes that I'm not studying either by tape, by the written word, or by the spoken word. I keep the Bible on tape in my car, my truck. Either one I get into, I got the Bible on tape. I've got tapes in there of, of Bible preachers, and I love listening to uh, some of those. If you listen to, if you want to study uh, today, and I don't care where you are in the world, you can get Dr. Stanley. I don't care where you are in the world, you can get Brother Jerry Vine. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can get all of the good preachers that have been in the last 30, 40 years that did stuff on tape and, and put it out there, that you can get it. And you can, you can look them up and you can find sermons by many, many of them. I have so many sermons and I got sermons by just regular everyday preachers that are absolutely wonderful. They are filled with, with the glorious gospel and the provision that God made for us to be able to use. You want a spiritual meal? Search it out. When a person wants to go out on Friday night and eat a very nice meal, something they don't have every day, they go out and they find a restaurant that has something a little bit special and they order it and they pay for it and they eat it. Now, if you want something very special from God, you get his book. It won't cost you a penny. And you get in it. And you order from the Lord. Lord Jesus, I want you to show me what I'm reading. Holy Spirit, I want you to show me what this said. He said, and you shall come out of your place, out of the north parts. You and more people with you. All of them riding upon horses. A great company and a mighty army. Wow. God showed me that's the northern part. And, and you're going to be riding on horses. Ah, I don't think this refers to Russia, as some people think. Or Syria. In fact, it's the Antichrist that's going to be coming against the armies of God. And so... Oh, we, look, we can ask God to show us what we're reading, what we're studying, and we can learn by it. If a, if a, if a little old guy with an eighth grade education can do it, anybody else can too. I guess our time has come and gone. I'm going to close out now and uh, ask the Lord to show me how to find out on this new machine that I have how to keep my time. I think I'm at 44 minutes in 45 seconds. But we're going to find out in a minute when I close it out. And so 
I'm hoping I'm closing it out in the right place. And that's a pause. <laughs>